Okay, we're going to walk through an example of how to do a factorial experiment in R. This is from Schmidt, which is the textbook that's on uh, reserve. Um, it's a little bit longer, so you might want to take this video in chunks. Um, so, we're, so just a heads up on that one. So it's going to be a little bit on the longer side, just because we're literally going to go through every little bit of piece that you need to do uh, to do this in R. Um, similar idea can be done in Excel. It's a little more difficult because you have to actually generate the the, the columns and that you need, whereas R actually already understands how to do that. Um, it also, we're going to look at a package in R called FRF2 and DOE, which actually will pick the pick the designs for you, and we'll see how that works too, which R, which Excel will not be able to do. Um, so um, R is kind of the best choice for doing these factorial experiments. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So a factorial experiment in R. So we're not going to want to do this all by hand. So in R, the nice thing is that there's always a package to do pretty much anything. And so we're going to have to load a new package that has in, installed. So you don't have to do these generation by hand. Unfortunately, if you do this in Excel, if you do it with, without add-ons, you have to do this by hand, which is quite miserable. So how do I suggest you just get into R to do these kind of experiments? So load your package, you're going to have to load it. So one of the things you have to do is install it. Then you have to use it by referring it to its library. Right? And you do this once. And you do this every time you start R. So in the two packages that we're going to use for this class, for this particular thing, is doe.base an FRF2. And there's another one that you can do, and Python has the same kind of packages. There's PyDOE, and there's a few other things that can do similar type of ideas. So to do this, we do this for once. We just say install packages. Sometimes you'll see um, an install. This will download it. You might need to be connected to the internet if you want to do this particular one. Once you've got that, you just have to make sure you load these into memory is basically what's going on. And so you're just saying, I'm going to go ahead and use those packages after installing. You only have to do the first part once ever on an installation. After that, you just refer that I want to add on all the functions that belong in these libraries. And then test to see if you did it right. If you type this FRF2, the output will show you a model. Right? It'll show you a model. So in this case, this says eight runs. Per replicate, and I want a three factored experiment, so it's basically making a two to the three. And so this eight is there, and the three is coming from there. And there's a lot of different ways to specify an experiment in FRF2 package, but this is one of them. And we'll come back and see how we use this later on. So now, going through the whole example, that's just a test to see if you've actually installed it right. So what we're going to do is we're taking an example that Schmidt uses. There's a factory that produces plastic injection molded parts, and it's always concerned with shrinkage. So the idea is that it, once it cools off, it actually the part kind of shrinks. So typically, a die for a part is cat or created oversized to allow for this plastic to shrink after it's been produced. In this instance, a new die has been created for a part. The engineering question was, is what are the proper process settings to produce a product with the proper dimensions? So what was the actual right process setting? So optimization, right, is one of our goals of design of experiments. The objective is that to determine the effect of injection velocity, which we're going to call A, the cooling time B, the barrel zone temperature, so in the barrel of the injection C, the mold temperature is D, the hold pressure, so how much pressure do we hold when we're letting it kind of form, is E, the back pressure, so when we pull up, when we pull the mold off, is F. And the shrinkage of the part is wants to be staying to at 14.5 nominally at an alpha significance of 0 0.01. So we want to try to keep this at 14.5, you know, nominally as our actual average. So Schmidt actually looks in both directions, but we're going to simplify it for uh, both for the example purposes. So it looked at the Schmidt actually does length and width. We're just going to look at just length just to make the problem a little bit easier understand so a couple of issues because we're dealing with this is the true this is engineering issues that come up we can't do the experiment perfectly so we have to modify our designs that modify 
our design or how we run it. There are only two levels allowed for each setting. Okay, well, that's nice fixed. In the discussion regarding the barrel zone timber, there's actually six different control points. But after discussions is agreed in the interest of uh, standard operating procedure simplification, we only want two set of levels to be used. The main effects are the only thing we concern ourselves about right now. That's a key thing. We do not worry about interaction effects. Due to automated level of this process, the need for true randomization is not really required. So we do it pretty automated on this one, so we don't really have a whole lot of human issues involved. Um, finance and plant controls indicated there are funds and time available to do only 40 tests. So we have to figure out what can we do in 40 tests to, to show this stuff. And then, of course, there's always that one little thing. Plant control reiterates that mold temperature adjustment requires a special technician who's only available to do one change. So we need this might modify modify the order we run. Right? So we'd like to randomize it, but we can't afford to do that because this one person can only come in to do one change. So that's the reality of engineering, is you're always going to have these little things that are going to make it so you can't do the experiment exactly as designed. You have to make modifications to kind of accommodate for those. So some thought questions. So the full factorial, how many runs are required for a replicate if the decision is made to run the entire experiment as a balanced full factorial? Well, there's six factors, two levels each. So two to the six would have been 64 runs. Well, we only have 40, so we can't do that. Um, is the full factorial experiment even required? Right? Why or why not? Well, not really, because we didn't need anything beyond our main effects, right? A full factorial would be doing all the interactions all the way up to a six-way interaction. We already know ahead of time, we don't need anything above a main effect, so why are we wasting our time with this? So our goal is to minimize the runs per replicate in order to maximize the usage of our available resources, right? Which is, in this case, is 40 runs is what we get to work with. That's our resources. So what would be the optimal fractional factorial experiment design that we can have? Well, we might have some options here, so let's look at our feasibilities. We have 40 of tailable runs. We only need to only concern ourselves with the six effect means. As long as we don't do something stupid and make an R2 experiment where we're aliasing main effects to mailing effects, we should be fine. Right? So we want to have at least an R3 or higher. That's what we want to look for, okay? So we could possibly use a fra fractional, right? So if we did a half fractional, we'd do six minus one, 32 runs per replicate. Unfortunately, this isn't gonna work because I only have 40 runs, I'd barely be able to run even this one once, right? I could have save 80 runs, but eight runs, but I wouldn't do enough to actually get any real degrees of freedom that I would need for uh, the errors that I wanna work on this one. So that's not gonna work. Quarter fractional? Well, that's 16 runs per replicate, right? That might actually work. So we could actually run this, you know, twice at least and get some get some variance on this thing, calculate some error. It might work, so that might be a possibility. Eighth fractional, sure, that can work too. We could actually run the whole thing five times, which would really give us some good indications on what the error is going to be, um, get us a bit better feeling about what's going on here. Uh, we don't have to run it as often. We use up exactly the amount of the resources we had available. If I did a 16th fractional, well, I'm going to have a problem. Six to the four, I only have four runs per replicate. I can guarantee what's going to happen is that's going to be at least a resolution two or worse type of situation, right? You're doing way too much aliasing. 16 factorials, fractionals barely ever work at that low of a number of factors, right? So we're going to stick with those. So we're going to stick with the possibility of going green lighting one of these two, right? Those are our feasible region. We can either go with five replicates of the six to the three, or we can go two replicates of six to the two and not use available runs. What's your choice, right? So if you ever see these on exams or whatever, a lot of the times you'll have two possible right answers. As long as you know why you're picking one over the other and can carry through the justification, you're fine. So don't be worried that you can't figure out the one right answer because a lot of the times in design of experiments, there isn't just one right answer. You have to go with one and then make sure you understand why, what the trade-offs are for that particular one. This case, we're gonna go with the eighth fractional. Right, maximize my resource, everything seems to work great, so I'm going to use a 6.3 R. So, in R, I load the library up, right? So this is bringing in the library, 
I'm going to go ahead and see what a 6-3 looks like. So why is it designated this? So 2 to the 6 minus 3 has the number of runs, runs equivalent to a 6-3, which is equal to 8. So I'm going to get this 8 is going to be where I put this number. And this 3 and this 6 is how many factors I had. That's this number. And so notice what happens is R will automatically give you the patterns that are needed. Right? It says run these experiments. So run exactly these experiments. Don't run anything outside of that range. Right? So that's exactly what it's trying to make you do. It says do these runs only. Right, not the other batch of them, right? And there's there's eight of these, right? So there's eight of these sets. This is one eighth of the full set, right? And that's what it's doing. It's just saying these are the eight that you, these are the one eighth of the runs that you need to run to make this work. So you can get the same things by also saying, I can also say number of factors is six, and I want a resolution of three or better, right? And so this will look up. This looks up a design coming from a catalog. Right. You can also get some specific characteristics about the design. So you ask it for design info, it says what type is it? It's an FRF2. Alias, it'll say what's alias with each other. So it'll say what the letters are, which is this is kind of, this is just a stupid line. Doesn't really ever mean anything. And basically it already gives you the aliasing strings up to two-way interactions. Okay, so um, R does not show you the three, but these are, this set is aliased with each other. This set is aliased with each other. So these are like in those little boxes we talked about before. These are the little boxes that you have. Now granted, it does not include above a two-way. It does not include above the two-way interactions, but it doesn't really matter. We have our A, B, C, D, E, F are all sitting in different boxes. And there is, remember this is an R3. So there is another bus seat over here that doesn't have any mains in it, but it's got three leftover two-way interactions, right? So these are our little boxes. These are our alias, We've talked about strings before. Right, so as long as only one good one is in each one of those, we're good, we're good to go. We don't wanna have any ones that we, we don't wanna have more than two good, two that we want to be paying attention to in there. So these all, that all works, we already said that. So now we're gonna look at actually how to set this up. So here's my plus and minus my plus and minus settings. So I actually had these hard values. And I can actually put this into FR2 FR2 to make it actually mean more to me if I really want to do this. So I can actually say I'm gonna make an 8-6 factor. I can give the names if factors are for injection velocity one and three, cool time is 30 and 40, barrel zone. So I'm literally laying out each one. This is just all cosmetics. and doesn't affect the analysis. But some people like it, right? So this time was when I actually look at the design, it actually says instead instead of plus minuses, I actually get the actual value so I can see what's going on here. And notice what I did up here, I put the design into a variable, right? So now I can actually start working with that name again. And if I want the one plus one chart again, I can actually just say, give me the design in numbers of my design and it'll give me my plus ones and minus ones again. Okay, so either one's fine. And recheck, so this is if I did a re-aliasing check, so notice now, now it says what does A, B, C, D, E, F actually equal to? So I can actually follow that along, but it's basically the same. I just now have actual more cosmetic names for it. It's just an entirely a cosmetic thing. It has no impact whatsoever on your analysis. Just makes it look better for some people. So the replications, if I want FRF2 to generate replications for you, just tack on how many you want. So in this case, it says, I want the two, I want a two to the six minus three, and I want five replications or 40 runs. 
and literally it'll say, okay, here's all my different options. It now has a run number and a standard number. It's randomizing things. But then it says, here is all of the ones that I want to run, right? So here's the whole set of all the 40 experiments that I want to run right there, 40. And we want to make sure that we don't want to reset it each time because we don't, we have where we don't want to reset it each time. So we want to group same settings. I can just say, turn the repeat only true. And now notice that you get five of the same. Then I get another five of the same somewhere in here. And then I get, you know, five of the same every time. So, because I didn't really care that I had to mix and match them because I wasn't really wasn't worried about that. So I can do that with repeat dot only equals true. Then I'm setting myself up for data I collected. So I've got my design, got it all set up. I got my replications, I got my repeat only. I now take my design numbers. I just want the numbers. Just the plus ones, minus ones here. Then I'm gonna stick it into my collector. Then I'm going to sort it by the fourth factor. Right, I'm doing that because my technician only can do one change. So this sorts it so that fourth factor, which in this case is one, two, three, four, the mold temperature, is only going to be changed once. So once I've done that, I've got the collect, I got that, and so use my sheet. So what I've done is remember back here, I've now written this out. So I wrote, sent out as a CSV file. I then take that CSV file, I store the response variables, the response that are the experimental outcome. And then I read it back in again. So I read the, this is, this is the updated file that has the response variables in it. And I read it back into a my collected data set. Now I've got a data set that I'm good to go. And so now I can confirm them. So now I'm going back to my friend. This is the friend, the linear regression. So once we've collected the data, we're right back to doing linear regressions again, right? And remember the stars mean show all interactions, even though we don't really want to care about that. We're going to see that. And we're going to notice that our have our enter, we have our coefficients. This is just giving a quick summary, right? So I've got my intercept, which is almost zero. I've got all my I've got all my coefficients for each one of them. And notice I'm going to have some some interactions will be marked in a that's due to the fractional nature. It means that that one never changed. Right? It usually means that means that interaction was not tested or the very the value of ignition velocity and barrel zone combined together never changed right. so we're gonna a lot of them but we're gonna notice that only one's critical we're gonna willing to live with that so we're gonna keep it in mind so looking for main effects only so here we're gonna go so I went back so notice this one's different note this has pluses, not stars. I'm looking at just the main effects. So now we're back to what I originally used to have before. So I now have this, remember this is the average of the data. Which is pretty good. We're keeping it about the 14.5, which is good. But these are all influencing it. So the injection velocity is causing it to go high. The cooling temperature going up is going to cause it to go low, right? I have my significance. I have my F statistics, which means I have a good model or a meaningful model. 
so meaningful it's different than the mean model I have a pretty good R adjusted square so this is a useful model so meaningful is I have this is above 8 this is about 0.8 or above so it's useful so this is actually a pretty decent model for right now so I need to keep my mold temperature low so the mold temperature is going to be adding 0.34 so I want to make sure that that's going to be low and I really only want to focus on a couple of these right so at this point this is a good one this is a good one this is a good one this one's a good one this one eh, I don't really care because that one's really not going to be playing ball right and so I might want to just control what's going to happen to each of those and so I'm just going to do this model this actually tells me what's going to what I want to do to them and so what happened was they tried to keep all that under control by managing those and the epilogue of this whole particular experiment was they did 25 runs of the best conditions unfortunately not one of the 25 was able to achieve the proper normal tolerance of width uh, this is old sorry this is not supposed to be width this should be length of the 14.5 plus or minus 0.05 so what did they do decide at this point they couldn't figure out that there is no optimal solution so they had to redesign the die and that's just sometimes happens right and to finish this up uh, the possibility for using generators so one of the things you can do in R is actually have it do the generations for you so you can say I want in this case I have a runs factors so that's going to be a 2, 4. Since I want to fit it in 8, it's going to be minus 1. And so I'm going to have at least one generator. And this one says generate, add the last letter, make it equal to, this means make D equal to A, B, C. And then that actually will give me this specific factor, this, this specific fractional one. Right, so I can actually force it with a generator. If I need more than one generator... Then I just go generator equals a character string of like say a b and b c for example. This will make this is for like let's say a two five minus two experiment. This will be generator one, so it'll be d equals a b. This will be generator two, which means it'll be e equals b c. Right, so that's how you can add more than one generator if you really really want to so look at the online package for fr2 you can get into more details we don't really go into the super complicated parts if you can understand what's in this particular lecture you're fine for what you need to do for your experiments and really you're just using these packages to help you build out these grids so that you can bring them so you can ex extract them add your data on import them in and go right back to using regressions just like we always have Right, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and finish that up. I'll probably see you in some of the sessions to kind of go over some more things in detail with you synchronously. But this should get you started. All right, talk to you later.